Is that? Good to go. Great. Thank you. I want to welcome everybody uh, to the December 2022 Manhattan Community Board Transportation and Street Activity Permit Committee. Uh, this is Tuesday, December 6th, and we're starting at 6.05 p.m. Uh, with quorum. So thank you. Pretty full agenda. So if you go on to the next slide. There are only three things, but hopefully we'll perhaps be able to get through a resolution on the first one and have discussions to close up the co-naming as much as we can, uh, and then have something new to talk about for item number three. So let's move on to last mile logistics, which you may recall is a continuation of last month when we had Chris Carroll come to present about Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine's e-commerce delivery last mile logistics. What I want to talk about tonight is not about the report per se, although I hope you all got an opportunity to read it, but to look at the different initiatives that have been suggested. And they are in process, so it's not a matter that he just made them all up. They're all in process, but he put them together, and it's a real clear way of looking at what's out there right now. For the next slide, this is... It's online for the report, and hopefully those of you have seen it, those who haven't seen it, you may want to look it up. And you can find it at the Manhattan Borough President Office website. And this we're going to look at for the resolution, it would be what should our response be to the recommendations that are made? So think about that versus the program as a whole. Next. He first announced it uh, on October 15th. And the big thing is every day, 2.4 million products are bought online, packaged and transported and delivered to New York City. And if you look at the slide, whoops, go back one. Go to the map. You'll see this is done by density and you'll see that we, the congestion zone is the same place with e-commerce. Package deliveries are the high, most dense as well. So we are the, among the most affected in the city as a district. Next. And yes, it can get pretty, uh, Midtown definitely has a higher density than we do, but you're gonna see it all around the city. This is actually from the Borough President's report. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is across the street from me in May. So I took another slide, because this is, this was taken earlier this week, uh, or the end of last week, and now you can see FedEx as well as one of the Amazon uh, contractors that's out there. It's just getting worse as we approach the holiday season. If you went, this was at the same time. If I went down one more block to the to the north, you can see there were two FedExes making deliveries at the same time as well. And again, most of these last mile deliveries are made on hand carts, as you can see this man doing. And they're using their trucks themselves as distribution centers. If you go to the next one, if you look inside the buildings, you can see why there's so much going out on the streets because this is what it looks like at each of the residences when it's delivered. And this is one of multiple deliveries a day at, at this particular residence. And this is on Chambers Street. Doesn't look terribly different. And I think that's the last of those. So, if Miriam, I know you're in the audience. If you'd like to talk about your experience in FIDI. Uh, yeah, so in FIDI, we have much smaller streets. So the situation is, is that much more um, dire. Um, I was trying to come by one of those very tiny, come down one of those very tiny streets. It is Cliff Street uh, between Fulton and John. A lot of our streets were literally made for horses, and so that's why they're very narrow. And there's already city bikes on that street, and there had already been um, a place where sometimes the UPS guy would load, but he never really uh, impacted the pedestrian or vehicle traffic um, that I'd seen. But uh, recently, Amazon is affecting both the pedestrian tax traffic and the vehicular traffic because they're taking up the entire sidewalk with these um, like mobile shelves, these these carts of, with shelves upon shelves of all these packages. That's all over the sidewalk, several employees at once. And then they're taking over the street because they're, I mean, effectively not even pulled over. They're 
because because the street's so narrow, they basically like stopped in the middle of the street with their trunks open or whatever, while they load all this stuff from off the shelves into their vehicles, I guess, for delivery. And so what's happening is traffic is backing up down Cliff Street onto John, which depending upon what time of day it is, could be really bad because John is already the street that we've made some, you know, given some allowances um, to be backed up so that the school buses could stop, so that, you know, the post office could have a, a parking space or several parking spaces. Like we've done a lot of things and John Street is another one of these very tiny one way streets um, at that juncture at least. So I took a video and I called 311 as to what was happening. I, actually, I even got out of my car at one point and attempted to ask the drivers how long they were going to be there, how, how long this loading was going to take because people were backed up all the way down the block behind me and they didn't even respond. I don't know if they were just ignoring me, if they didn't speak English, I'm not sure what was happening. But at that point I called 311. Okay, yeah, and thank you. So you have a slightly different situation as well in that she's talking about their loading a truck to take it for the last mile, where the other ones that you saw were bigger trucks coming in to deliver to do the last mile, but nevertheless, they would they were the micro centers. Hers were probably coming out of some micro center on these shelves to be loaded onto the truck. So it's it's all part of the same process, but different elements of it. And I'm sure you've all seen it in other neighborhoods as well. So Pat and Tammy. Pat, you need to unmute, you go first. Thought I had unmuted myself, sorry. It's twofold, it's a transportation issue and it's a quality of life issue. So you and I both have been talking to Lucian about this. We have gotten people complaining that the people in the parking lot, because you know, I work on the corner of Cliff and Fulton. So the people in the parking lot, they've taken over the, the, the Amazon Whole Foods arm of this has taken over the parking lot that's at ground level or grade level. They have cursed out one of, one of the neighbors. Daron, who's on our board lives there. He said the noise, he's getting all this, you know, issue with noise from these people working and screaming at one another and honking horns and all that's going on. Mariana, you also said that on Fulton Street, and I've noticed on Fulton Street, there were four panel trucks. There's been three to four panel trucks every day lined up on Fulton where they are unpacking these trucks in the middle of the street, not on the sidewalk, but in the middle of the street, holding up traffic. So it's a traffic issue and it's a quality of life issue. And I don't know, but we've got to, you know, obviously do something about this. Well, thanks as we're working on today. That's what we're going to be working on today. In fact, River Terrace, uh, behind where I live, they shut down completely. They, they actually, they have multiple trucks come in and just take over the whole block. So enough, nobody can use they the seem street. to love these one way streets that, that you know, at least, at least in Fidei, they're mostly on the one way streets. That's so you can't yeah, even try to avoid them. But both yeah, of them feel like the they're out of the way. But still... Tammy, let's hear what you have to say. So, funny that Mariana said that uh, on the two way streets in southern Battery Park City, we have the issue that. The larger uh, box trucks, 18 mullers and mm -hmm. uh, close to that park in the center of the street <laughs> and unload just directly in the street. Um, when they there are too many of them, which has been happening lately, they've been actually lining up all the way down. To say that it's um, dangerous is an underestimation of the facts. Uh, it, we need loading centers, unloading centers. Uh, you know, I don't know whether or not there could be some kind of discussion with commercial properties to allow you know distribution centers within their own buildings as they build new and residential properties as well because even though for example gateway plaza which is a very large residential complex has a driveway they do not allow amazon to park their truck in the driveway to do deliveries in their loading docks 
So there is a commercial because they park there too long. Um, it's too much and it doesn't have good visuals. So we are stuck at the moment with a need that no industry thus far that I've met is seeking to solve. Um, so I think there needs to be a little bit of flexibility on all aspects, many asks, because through many, many asks, maybe we can get one. Great. Well, let's go. Uh, what I want to do is go through the borough president's plan because he had a lot of very smart people looking at it and breaking it down to the many issues. So we'll look at that and then move forward. So it won't, he in fact, has it broken down into four different goals and we'll look at them separately because they each include different elements that you may or may not have thought of. If you go to the next. Yeah, and the definitions, you can see why this is kind of complex. There's a last mile delivery, which is actually moving from the truck or distribution center to the places where it's being dropped off. You've heard examples of people in both different steps of the process. Uh, it all has to be dealt with. The last mile companies do include UPS, FedEx, DHL, various logistic companies, United States Parcel Service. We get all United States Postal Service, we get all of them. Uh, micro fulfillment centers are small facilities, 10,000 square feet or less used by e-commerce companies, and they could be storefronts, and that could be what Mariama was running up against where they were bringing the shelves from. It could also be that they're using the trucks themselves, and hence the 18 wheelers that you see in the middle of South End Avenue and some of the big box trucks you see in North End. The staging areas are the locations where parcels are sorted, consolidated, and loaded onto the delivery vehicles, that final last mile going to the residents. Just so you know a few of the terminologies that are used within this report. Go to the next one. Yeah, and to look at, here's a case where uh, the cargo bikes that are used for whole food deliveries. Again, here the fulfillment center is actually whole food store itself. Uh, and again, the way the cargo bike corrals changed or morphed while piloting here in our district was they did add space for people to be able to move around and do more of the sorting and loading more conveniently. So that was a DOT learning curve that occurred. And again, it is very nice, Jill, there's the sidewalks are kept clear because there is inside space inside Whole Foods where they actually do most of the work and just the loading onto the last mile delivery e-bikes is all that occurs and occurs at the curbside. So this is where the process is for this particular program. Now, how do we do it with more of them? Next. So goal number one, getting the last mile operations off of our streets and sidewalks. There were two recommendations to think about. One, repurposing parking garages for e-commerce fulfillment centers. So when the big trucks come in from outside our district, where are they going to sort them, reload them, everything together? That's what the repurposing of the garages would be for. Exploring utilizing our waterfront or cargo delivery in staging. Now, let you know these things are all put together very nicely in the borough president's report. But I want you to know these are things are going and are in process. So for those that you may not be aware of, I want to make sure you realize kind of what's going on out there. Next. For instance, the Blue Highways program, which I'm hoping to hear about in a future Transportation Committee meeting. It's a little too early for them to have much to report at this point. But anyway, the city is in the process of exploring pilot program to facilitate new transloading operations of waterborne freight to sustainable last mile methods on city owned marine facilities. Remember, this is a program, as it says, of the DOT and the EDC. So they are jointly working on this project. And as you can see, they're showing here electrical vehicles and a cargo bike, as well as small uh, vehicles. Go to the next one to get an example. And they had to go to London to get a picture of the example. But nevertheless, this is the sort of thing they're envisaging. And that would be that there'd be some kind of marine vessel that would bring freight in and it would be downloaded to a cargo bike and or a vehicle again trying to make everything as electric as possible next 
So why do we care about this? Reported in Streets blog. And so you can see I, I put down the various connections here, both to the Blue Highway program as well as to the Streets blog's article about this. Six piers are being viewed in New York City for the Blue Highway's freight delivery pilot program. Three of them are in Manhattan, one of them in our district at Pier 6, which is also known as the downtown heliport. Two of them at Pier 36 and the 23rd Street Skyport are also for getting within the congestion zone kind of area, distributing, again, via waterway. Why? Brooklyn and the Bronx have the other three. This is where there's a lot of inequity issues being raised with the large trucks being brought in to the city with a lot of freight. And then they're being reloaded again and brought by truck out of those boroughs into Manhattan. So they're trying to do a little bit of social justice to Brooklyn and the Bronx by letting more of the departures be via waterway. And to do something more reasonable for Manhattan by we would be the recipients of it. And this is funded by a $5.2 million federal grant. So I want you to know there is funding and that's why this is in the process. Next, and yes, just to remind people, where is like Pier 6? Ask you a question, Betty? One second. Just to remind everybody where Pier 6 is. Okay. Now, if you'd like to ask. I'm not sure I understand. Maybe this is a stupid question. Why, why are the companies not paying for this when they're the ones, it's their, it's their merchandise that's being delivered and taking up our city streets? I don't understand why. We, do, we, we, pay, we pay for the streets. And federal money and state money also pay for the streets. Uh, so we don't ask private vehicles. We don't ask shopkeepers. We don't ask Amazon or anyone else to pay for our streets. No, Why should we ask to pay for our waterway? Our streets. They're the ones that are using the streets, stopping traffic, making it inconvenient for the residents who pay taxes. So I'm just not sure I understand. Well, so do they. But nevertheless, they're giving another alternative. People are still going to order. order so where, how is that freight going to come into Manhattan and how is it going to be handled? And so they're looking at other means to get them no, off I, the streets. I get it, but I'm saying, well, I don't understand why these companies are not paying for that then. It's their merchandise. Why, well, why is the federal grant paying for them to figure out or it to be figured out how to make their deliveries? Large, they're not. Large infrastructure projects that are done are usually done with federal and state money. This was sought by the city and the state from the federal government, and it was part of some of the big uh, legislations that were out there that President Biden had been pushing to electrify more of America. Okay, I'm gonna back off, but it doesn't make any sense to me that the companies are not paying. Well, they pay for our bridges too. So I, you know, the federal government gets involved in lots of things. They're paying for gateway tunnel too. It's, it's part of those no, many, many programs with funding. Uh, Mariama, and then just Justine, Mimi, sorry, I should have Mimi first and Eric because they're committee members, and then Justine and Mariama. Sorry. Uh, um, I'm curious about, so like Pier 6, isn't that where all the helicopters are? Yes. Isn't it a little dangerous to unload boats next to helicopters? Don't get too worried about the details. Like I said, I'm hoping to have them come in and present, but they're too early in the process at this point to be able to say anything. So I'm looking, don't get too much in the weeds because as far as that goes, they, I will have them come in, we'll talk about it in detail and there'll be a more focused resolution specifically about Pier 6 and that process. This process today is about the whole issue of e-commerce delivery in general. Okay. But I just sure. want people to know these other programs are here, not to distract you, but to realize these aren't just figments of the imagination of the borough president, but these are in fact programs that he and many people in city government are aware of are, are occurring. They're happening. Cool. Yeah, well, yeah. But we'll, we'll worry about them one by one, but Eric? Yeah, no, it's just a follow up a little bit and it's just a small comment on this. Yeah, um, so the federal government I'm thinking is just pursuing options. Um, but 
yeah, there should definitely be some fee structure for whoever, whichever companies will be using it. And because maybe there's other competitors and, and if this is a public uh, asset, there should be some fee structure, That that's all. And then um, as the conversation was going, I was thinking of, of, of the Coast Guard. Uh, remember they said that they have an unused dock area, but um, yeah, that, that, that's all. I just wanted to add that. And I'm glad they're considering this blue highway. I mean, we're surrounded by water, might as well use it. Okay. Well, and that's why we do need to hear about the Blue Highway, because I, I do think things like the Coast Guard and other stations could very well come into play at some point. So I do think we need to opine this just isn't the particular time. Because it's too much in the weeds, and you're going to see we have four goals to go through, each with multiple items to them. So, Justine and Mariama? So much. Um so one question about the parking garages when it says repurpose them does that mean well what does that mean if you know they're, what they're looking at is to get a portion of the space not necessarily the whole garage that is set aside where these vehicles can pull in do their sort what they're now doing on the streets and the sidewalks have a place to get off the street to go and do it the underground garages, garages as well as Wait, street. Yeah, yeah, just really quick. Um, specifically in this proposal, many underground parking garages and parking garages that are at street level. Um, many of them around the city are known uh, uh, as accessory garages, according to the New York City zoning resolution. And as such, um, uh, no activity is permitted to take place other than the storage of residents vehicles and accessory parking. What this asks, what the borough president's proposal in part asks to do is to uh, tweak zoning to permit the last mile kind of D kind of depalleting of, of packages to load onto, you know, neighborhood circulating, you know, whether people with carts or cargo bikes or, you know, whatever for that to happen off street in those garages to provide you know, uh, an alternative use because there are parking garages that are not full um, in the five boroughs. Well, would you would you mind if I just read the two sentences from the report on that? Yeah, give me some more information because then I have questions. Okay. But go ahead, this Dana. is from Mark's report. It says the city should amend the zoning resolution to establish a special permit enabling e-commerce carriers to rent space from private parking garages to use for last mile operations. Freight trucks could then deliver parcels to the garages during off hours for processing and sorting, et cetera. That's helpful, Detta, because it's, okay, it's it's the company that's, um, uh, the, the e-commerce company that's paying for the garage, they're paying for the space, and it's not a government, okay, so that's good. So that's step one, thank you for that. And they're paying for the space, so that's being given up. Second question relates to kind of following up with, with what, um, Pat was saying about the, the the funding, the federal funding. I'm assuming, Barry, when you said the infrastructure project, it's it's the infrastructure project is to build the ferry terminals to take the boats to come in or to, or to build it out? Because what are they paying for? Yeah, it's to build out right now. The ones that are suggested are existing piers that can function as piers. They can but work function as need piers, to be done. but they don't right now. I mean, as so, like they don't have boats pulling up to them. No, I, I believe the money's for to study, right? I mean, this this grant program, I believe, is to is to is to, is to perform study. studies and feasibility studies. And this grant program is not unrelated to the grant that, um, for example, the the electric ferry carrier applied for received money to look at um, uh, uh, what would it take to. Um, install electric charging points for the, the Elizabeth, New Jersey ferry service. But a lot of these grants provide funding sometimes for work, but a lot of times to provide the, the, the means to study something because the city has to hire up. They don't have the capacity to do those studies on their own. So I guess my concern then is five point whatever billion dollars for a study for Million. something Hot million, not billion, good, five million. But still, it seems like an awful lot of money to spend on a study. For, uh, there's got to be a better way. The, the study should be paid for by the companies because they are taking up public space. 
Well, but so is, so is everybody else who uses. I mean, I think one way to look at it is that New York City, New Yorkers pay a lot of taxes to the federal government. And if we get them back as in the form of grants, it's essentially this is the money that we've already paid in. And either we get the grants or somebody else gets the grants. It's free money. Oh, and I, I'm happy to take the five million and spend it on affordable housing. But they it's not available for that. It's not fungible. Okay, so yeah, let's not create new problems. We're looking at what are we going to do with our e-commerce to get it off our streets? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think Mariama was next. And then uh we'll hear from Jeff and Tammy after that. Okay. Yeah, I was going to speak to Pat's point too to remind her it was actually when this came up the first time the original original iteration of the pilot program, a number of us pushed back on that. Um, and that led to negotiations that reduced the amount of space that Amazon was planning to take up because it is a private corporation that is was taking over public space, the sidewalk and some some parking spaces that were being used by residents and the, the amount of the taxes that we pay, no one pays it like those who pay real estate tax down here. I mean, you know, so the residents were entitled to um, some spaces down there. And so we had those conversations and it did lead to a reduction in a more of a shared space. Um, the ironic thing is uh, infamously, Jeff Bezos actually does not pay taxes. Uh, so we, we basically did give him that free uh, real estate, which is the sidewalk. Yeah, uh, Jeff and Tammy. Um, I actually did a little walk around Fidei and Seaport area earlier today um, to try to see what spaces would theoretically be available um, for al alternatives to what they're using, which is the street and the sidewalks. Uh, and I walked down Cliff Street. I saw that there's a parking lot being used uh, there for uh, offloading, which I guess would be consistent with what the borough president is suggesting, although we heard at the last community board meeting that local residents are complaining about that. And, and I wanted to sort of give a cautionary note. This is a refrain I give in lots of different contexts. Most of our district is fully occupied right now. <laughs> it's not like we have spare space. And so um, to a large extent, Moving some undesirable usage from one location will result in that undesirable use being in some other location that will have other objectors. Uh, in terms of garages, as far as I know, there are there isn't a lot of garage capacity in our uh, district, um, and most of the garages are not well suited for being cargo terminals. Um, most of them would not even fit the kind of delivery trucks that are being used because the, uh, I mean, some of our local garages, including the one I park in, even if you've got a tall SUV, you can't get in there, much less some sort of box truck, which simply wouldn't fit in the door. Um, um, I, in walking around, I was specifically looking to find if there were garages that seemed to be big enough uh, to, to hold a truck. Um, and there appeared to be one at what used to be called Chase Manhattan Plaza, 28 Liberty Street, which was a commercial loading dock, uh, uh, somewhat like in the World Trade Center. And so, not surprisingly, it probably would be big enough to hold uh, delivery trucks. But all the other garages I saw were way too small to hold a delivery truck. They might hold a panel van or an SUV or whatever else may be delivering this stuff. They also tend to have like one entrance and exit. Uh, very narrowly constrained, often clogged with cars that are being getting ready to go in or go out. And the idea of having a delivery terminal in one of these garages, I mean, it's just not practical and realistic to expect it unless they were going to be completely converted into uh, a cargo uh, terminal. So I, I, I guess my, my sort of cautionary note here is that although a lot of the proposals, and I have the borough president's report up on my screen now, make sense in theory and may make sense in various parts of the city of New York. I fear that many, if not most of them would not make much sense in our particular district with its narrow streets. Uh, I'm not offering up a solution. 
Um, well, we're going to get than, there. Other than traffic on enforcement. I mean, the, the, the idea that Amazon can just take over a sidewalk um, uh, or take over a street and use it as a transshipment uh, cargo uh, point um, seems absurd to me. Uh, and if there were enforcement uh, that included removing the goods, I think these businesses would, would find another way to deliver their goods uh, than clogging the sidewalks. And the borough president's report mentions, you know, additional fines, but implies that the businesses would just include this as their cost of business. And only when the fines became, you know, exorbitant, which they're unlikely to be, would they do something other than what they are currently doing. So, I. I it's it's good to study all of these, but I but I think the problem is is really pervasive, uh, and like the photos that you showed, Betty, of Battery Park City, and you could just randomly pick any residential building um, in our district, and you will find sidewalks blocked, doorways blocked, streets blocked, um, and uh, I think the Whole Foods thing is kind of a model of the way it should be, but that requires some retrofitting of space where people can actually be doing this. And although I'm sure that most people wouldn't want that moving in next door to them. <laughs> you know? uh, we're concerned about the, here at that on South End Avenue. We've got some empty storefronts coming up. The last thing that I would want to see there is a transshipment um, location on South End Avenue uh, that would make the traffic situation worse. So I, I, I'm not being very constructive. I guess my, main point is let's make sure that the solution isn't worse than the problem. Yeah, no, that's appreciated. And and I, I have some draft ideas at the end, so. I'd like to send you my video you. if I could, Jeff, my it's, video yeah. of Cliff Street, because they weren't actually using the parking lot. They were using the sidewalk in the street when I filmed it. So that may give that's you a better idea. Yeah, no, I the residents are complaining. Them. I would like to see that, Mariama, and I and I've certainly seen instances of that kind of thing in lots of streets and sidewalks in in the neighborhood, including. And Jeff, it's Whole Foods that's using that that parking lot, so they're not the great. Okay, everybody, if you could wait for your hands, uh, Tammy is going to speak now. I so enjoy when I'm not the one having to be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So thank you, Betty. I am enjoying. There's a couple things. I cannot support this study strong enough, and I will tell you why. There is no current discussion and funding. Every single solitary CCLM meeting that we go to, which is the Climate Coalition for Lower Manhattan, I talk about how last mile delivery needs to be a part of the Climate Coalition's goals for solution. And a study like this will actually pursuant to what Jeff is saying, be really helpful for us because we don't have enough spots because of our street grid, because of everything else. I mean, yes, I could see the battery garage being potentially used that way, but there aren't enough locations. We don't wanna lose an open space, but what we wanna do is be able to find ways to, su to support the ideas. So I'm hopeful that um, without a study, we go nowhere. It doesn't get fixed and they stay on the sidewalks. With a study, we don't have to say prescriptive for what we want for the study. We just want to study. Some expert come back to us and give us multiple options. And really let us talk about what works because what we do know about Community Board 1 is what works in FIDI and the seaport, maybe the seaport, may not work in Tribeca, Battery Park City, Civic Center. Without a doubt, we need customized, tailored options that work within the landscape of who we are. But we need solutions. This is not going away anytime soon. And, and we cannot ignore the race towards public space being taken for other things. I much prefer having some garage, and I don't care if it's uh, wherever that garage is, if it is not full, and they can get a truck off the street, I'll take A, because it starts with one, one here, one there. More people are coming. We have, according to the Downtown Alliance, because I'm sitting and looking at their stuff right here. Okay, let's look, residential units. We have 
just in the downtown alliance zone alone right 33,677 units with 2533 under construction this is not going to change anytime soon so like i said i I, I'd be the first one to say, Betty, if the next comment is, let's get a resolution together, I'm in. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think that is really what I want people to think about. If you're saying it's a problem, then we need a solution. So let's move forward with that. So let's have Patrick's committee member and then Rosa. Thanks, Betty. Uh, I mean, if only some local neighborhood group sounded the alarm on these issues years ago. Um, I'm kidding. So, um, is, do we know the downtown alliance's um, position on specifically the uh, Manhattan Borough President's report and you know solutions that are in there specifically within the alliance's catchment area? No, and I, I say that because they they've been um, it's not publicly opposed. Certainly, privately opposed to street management um, <laughs> calls for street management in the past. And I'm not afraid to just call them out on that now, but um, it, 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 it's a problem and it's going to get in the way. We need to know about it now because we're going to spend all this time doing all this work and we're going to get high level opposition. It's, it's just, it's a problem. Patrick, let's hear what Lucian has to say because his hand is up and he may know something. Thanks. Well, I was going to say is that um, I heard some talk about enforcement. Currently, the city has a program called the Stipulated Fines Program. And that program essentially allows uh, last mile carriers to uh, 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 create a single baseline charge of what sort of some uh, penalties they'll pay the city for double parking or illegally parking their their trucks, um, and so they don't have to eat the the total sum of the of the fines that they they're issued uh, throughout the year. Um, so the city is essentially the current. You know, the current stance of the city is we are enabling the companies to park every which way and you know wherever they they can there is an acknowledgement that retail has you know, the retail sector has fundamentally changed and the way that we receive goods has fundamentally changed and you know uh, i think that the, the push to do big things is warranted given that we are trying to you know, fit a square peg in a round hole and we need to you know really think about how to reformat the way that we approach you know this very new world that we live in so i, I don't know if I, I i i'm sorry if i missed uh, a point that or question that patrick made that uh, uh uh you're hoping that i might be able to answer did i get it yeah no well no it was very helpful he was asking if you heard anything from the downtown alliance if they have taken any sort of position not that i know of tammy did you hear anything at the last board meeting uh no we actually had a discussion on two other topics but i am i would be happy to follow up with the downtown alliance and see where they're standing on stuff like that yeah and i think it'd be helpful if we can get a resolution together if they have something to react to as well <laughs> You know, I tend to think if it's not something that's being forced back onto the commercial uh, tenants versus having something that is a business opportunity for the parking garages, they would be significantly more um, supportive of it. Um, but just based on what I know from the past conversations Patrick has had, I have had, and things like that, if they're not, if the commercial either the building owners or the others have some kind of, um, it could be a win-win. I'll just leave it at that. I agree. And again, I'm looking at big scale. I am not looking at a resolution that tries to micromanage anything because this is way too big a topic for that. And there'll be lots of opportunities to deal with the various elements. Like I said, as more is known about them, the blue highways, well, then there's gonna be more things too. We need to, get people into the committee to talk about it. Uh, Rosa, since I promised you, and then Detta, committee member, and then Pat. Thank you so much, Betty. Um, so I wanted to speak about um, what Jeff was talking about before, which is 28 Liberty, AKA uh, Chase Plaza. Um, so I reached out to um, 
CBRE who managed the manages the property and mentioned the sort of crazy idea of using it as a pilot location because they do actually have a loading dock as as Jeff pointed out that is capable of taking in vehicles that are of larger than typical size. And they also happen to have like, I think they actually have about 500,000 square feet of subgrade space, which is incredible. That is accessed by that loading dock. And so to me, it's a win, obviously, if number one, who wants 500,000 square feet of subgrade space? Not many people. Number two, um, we need to get the stuff off of our streets. And so I think that would be a great test location. So I reached out to Chris Carroll with Lucian's help. Thank you, Lucian. Um, and, um, you know, they're not, and I don't think the Manhattan Borough President's Office is able to or wants to get directly involved, but it would be really interesting if we can somehow use that one location that we do know about and try to get a test like pilot program, right, um, started. So that's number one. So I'll just put that out there. Um, I don't know anybody in Amazon. So if anybody here does, then that would be awesome. Number two, um, I think you also said something, Jeff, about the fact that nobody wants to have a distribution center in their building, even though you guys have a lot of um, free retail space or otherwise completely underutilized and empty um, retail space in your neighborhood. Well, we actually have a distribution center in our building, um, FedEx. And I think that everybody thought it was going to be an absolute horror and we fought it until we could not. Um, and you know what? It's not a horror. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, like there's certain, you know, conflict issues of between where they put their ramp to get their carts down and where our building happens to load our enormous mountains of garbage. But beyond that, they have actually been good neighbors. And considering that, you know, these deliveries are, you know, generated by our purchases. I think it's reasonable to think that, you know, we need to figure out a way to take care of this all together, right? Unless everybody's going to stop shopping. Um, so number one, that, and that's amazing because you know what, just as we were talking about earlier, somebody else brought up, I think it was Mariama, they're paying to rent that space, right? So that's part of their cost of doing business. And it gets it off of our streets, which is a pain in the, well, whatever. And tush. And um, I think that that's what we need to start doing. So distribution spaces are not generally horrible. Um, and yeah, I think we absolutely must do a pilot program. And we do at least seem to know of one building in the FIDI neighborhood that might be able to accommodate such a thing. Um, so, and they are open to starting the discussion. So I think that that's a plus. So maybe we can try to, you know, in our own little way, help push that forward um, and bring some sanity back to our sidewalks. And I think I did have a third point, but I totally forgot what it is. So I'll be quiet for now and, and raise my hand again if I remember. Yeah, oh, well, thank you for that. And in fact, I was thinking about Brookfield Place too. They also have a very large loading docks oh. and parking under yes. all of those buildings. That yes. would be awesome. That's yeah, so there are a number of places that have things. Yes. So, yes, and we have like three more goals to go through. So a lot of these things are going to be revisited anyway. Uh, but Dana, if you'd like to speak and then we need to, we really need to move on. Okay. Are you unmuted? Thanks. So I did uh, a couple things. One is that yeah, I mean, I have a lot of uh, questions about the suggestions Mark Levine has made in this report, but I do think if there's money out there for a study, it's worth grabbing the money and investigating. Uh, like Jeff, I question whether some of these would be successful, but but uh, I'm, I'm all for looking into it. Um, like Patrick said, like curbside management is a problem with e-commerce delivery and with everything, not just delivery. We have a big problem everywhere in New York with uh, you know, sidewalk parking, bike lane parking, parking on the median. So I just, I that is a bigger issue than just, it's a bigger problem really than just e-commerce and just delivery. Um, also the stipulated fines, 
I worked at the Department of Finance. The, the, the discount they get is is really tiny, and the city has said that companies pay this, and that they they're given this minuscule discount, sometimes just one hundred ten dollars instead of one hundred twenty dollars on a ticket, so that they won't dispute the ticket because other people, because that would take up too much time, and the city has said that uh, they pay the same. They, they end up paying the same amounts that, that the people who can dispute tickets pay versus them who they give up their right to dispute tickets in, re, in return for having this pretty small discount. And the city has chipped away at that discount too. Um, so I see, I mean, in Mark's thing, he says that the independent budget office makes a different claim. But, you know, before I... I, I don't know the value of their research and how methodical and how it was because they're making the assumption that these deliveries are incentivized to, um, you know, you know, to park illegally because of the low cost of it. I would say they're incentivized to park illegally because they have no other option and they want to do business, and this is their only way to do business. So I don't think. I don't think like a difference of a of even a sixty dollar ticket versus an eighty dollar ticket is what's incentivizing them. I think it's because they have no other option. And me personally, I'm not even sure we need to get this off the streets. But if it were to remain on the streets, it needs to be organized. It needs to be in designated areas. And I would rather see a lot of other types of curbside use off the streets into garages, like people paying for off-street parking instead of trying to store their car for free on the, on the curbside. And then, and then maybe, maybe the curbside is the best place for loading, unloading. I'm not sure, but it, well, I'll just- That's why I asked people, do right. you think we have a problem with them being on the streets and sidewalks? I mean, I I'm think- I'm not at all, because otherwise I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about things that I think we have decided. a- Right. I, I don't necessarily think it has to be moved off our streets, but if it remains on the streets, there has to be has to be organized differently. It has to be a space allocated to that so that they're not blocking a through lane that's supposed to be a through lane. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And let's move on to the goal. And again, keep in mind that people are jumping on to other goals and try to stick to what we're talking about only. And in this one, to meet the growing demand, they're dealing with three different suggestions were made, making loading zones ubiquitous in all residential neighborhoods. Why? Because that's where a lot of these shipments are going. Growing the network of access point locations at mom and pop shops. And some of that was brought up. Well, that's going to be one issue. Uh, launching common carrier parcel locker pilot program, which is also getting a little closer to some of the things that uh, We're hearing about from Rosa that they aren't necessarily as bad as you think they're going to be. So if you go to the next one, let me see. Oh, okay. Neighborhood loading zones. I just wanted to point out we do not have any of these in our district. And that's because we wrote that it is legal to park with a placard or a city owned vehicle. So in our district, they don't make a lot of sense at this time until they change those rules and make it not possible. But these loading zones, keep in mind, this whole area is morphing kind of a bit anyway. And the DOT is kind of slow on making the rule changes they've already proposed for this year. Nevertheless, uh, these allow package deliveries by commercial vehicles. They allow taxi and car service pickup and drop offs. And they allow active, the key word is active, loading and unloading of personal vehicles. So again, not only does the driver have to be there, but people have to be getting in and out of the vehicle to be active. And that is one of the big changes that's occurring with loading zones, period, is putting time, pretty strict time limit and very much showing that activity must be going on. That's with commercial vehicles as well as these other kinds of vehicles. So keep in mind that is this is a problem for our district, but if you go to the next one, goal three, if anyone wants to comment on those, 
the distribution points, which I think at least we heard from Rosa about that. And I want to let you know that I was the borough president, Mark Levine, had a meeting of the, the transportation chairs from all 12 of the Manhattan community boards. Everyone came except for two uh, because they had a meeting at exactly the same time and had, so had a conflict. And they were more likely to rely on those because many of their buildings do not have doormen. They have no mechanism for things to be dropped off in the building. And that's the complaint. Things are stolen from their buildings, from outside their buildings, or they can't even get in at all. So keep in mind, this is written for a broader base than what applies to just us, but we still have people who would benefit from those things. And part of the goal I can tell you of the borough president is, if there were some of these using mom and pop shops for drop-offs that people said, oh, I one of my things left there rather than in my house because they can't be left at my building. It's also to minimize the number of stops that the last mile vehicle has to stop in. So if they can consolidate multiple people in a particular location, that's advantageous for that reason. Given I see no hands up, we'll move on to e-commerce delivery is more sustainable. Varying congestion pricing fees by the vehicle size, type, and time of day. Keep in mind in, in our CB1 resolution, the committee decided that it was not, it was too complex and they did not want to opine on that particular topic. So that's where we stand as a community board. They want to pilot green loading zones across Manhattan amend legislation to allow cargo bikes to be 48 inches in width, they're currently 36 inches, and building more public charging infrastructure in e-bikes. So let you know where we stand on this. Next slide. Green loading zones, by definition in the DOT, are curbside zones set aside for use by low and zero emission commercial vehicles, including e-cargo bikes and vans. So this is a move that's going to be occurring. Conflicting state and local laws have created another problem. In the final April 2020 New York, this is a New York state issue, not a New York City issue. But in the budget bill, the new EB bike definition is 36 inch maximum width. The problem was at that time, and here are a couple of examples, of some that were wider than 36 inches and they the businesses weren't able to use them because all of a sudden they became illegal. There is one glitch in this law though. If you look at Whole Foods, you'll notice these vehicles in the picture are integrated units. The bike unit is directly connected to the cargo portion. What Whole Foods uses is a trailer on an e-bike. Those are not covered by this piece of legislation. So the width is not restricted on trailers by any law. I'll point that out. But this bill made it difficult for smaller businesses to procure off the shelf cargo bike models, including those made by local manufacturers, because most of them are wider than 36 inches. And the US standard for pallets is 48 by 40 inches, which means doing mass loading using pallets can't be done on the bike restrictions that currently are under New York state law. And for those who are curious, if you're over 48 inches, then you use travel lanes. So for those concerned about travel lanes being congested with cargo bikes, if they go over 48 inches, yes, they legally have to be in what people consider car lanes. Also at this time, New York City is pushing for more electrified uh, infrastructure. DCAS currently has out uh, and a request for an expression of interest. This due date is sometime in late January. So again, we want them to come into committee, but it's not gonna be possible for them to know and report on results, probably until at least March or April. So this is another thing in the future that you can opine on. Don't worry about the details at this time. It's not for this resolution. I just want you to know how much effort is going on behind the scenes that you may not be aware of. And with this, they're asking any ideas there are using city property for bike repair, bike electrification, recharging stations, or anything that you have to suggest is open to people who are applying. So it'll be an interesting for DCAS. 
uh, in goal four, better enforce the traffic laws, which Detta was alluding to, uh, increasing enforcement of illegal parking, which really isn't happening, violations in loading zones. And again, it's complicated in our district since placards and citywide vehicles are allowed. They are legal. They're not illegal. Updating the stipulated fine program and fine schedule. Again, it does not have to be a major focus of what we choose to support or not support, and Detta spoke to that. And expanding the use of automated enforcement technology. This again would take us back to state law changes where they're talking about using camera systems for some of the enforcement of these issues. No more details are given other than that. So are there any comments? Otherwise, I hear what people say about, I have a draft resolution, some ideas to see. I wanna get a feel for what people agree with or on. So seeing no hands, we go on to kind of some therefore be it resolved things to see what people agree with. It's what I thought you might agree on. Therefore be it resolved, things we can support, reducing the congestion, road safety issues, air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, package waste, and other quality of life concerns caused by the current system of deliveries. Number two, taking delivery sorting and staging off of our streets and sidewalks throughout New York City repurposing at least parts of enclosed parking structures for e-commerce fulfillment centers. And notice I put in enclosed parking structures because I do know that, and I've heard the complaints about the open parking and the noise that can be produced around there that annoy the neighbors. Increasing the use of electric cargo bikes versus delivery trucks for last mile deliveries. And that's just increasing, not saying only, Increasing the enforcement of and fines for illegal parking by delivery vehicles. Using marine vessels versus large trucks to make deliveries to our district. Using electric marine vessels and e-cargo bikes or vehicles for any freight that arrives or leaves from our district via the waterway. Because again, it doesn't do us any good if they arrive electrically and then everything is sending off fumes getting to and from. And also making it illegal to park in any loading zone with a city owned vehicle or with a city issued placard, which would require a change in the city rules. So any comments on any of those so far? I mean, and I see, let me call it, Jeff's hand went up first, so I'm going to call on him first, and I need hands. Yeah, it was uh, kind of in follow-up to something that Detta said that made me start to think in terms of um, off the street or not. Certainly, it belongs off the sidewalk, um, um, or, or at least off blocking the sidewalk. Um, it, I, I think in terms of and in, and it certainly belongs not in traffic lanes in the uh, in in the street, um, but I'm not sure that it's ob it depends on where the alternatives are. I think <laughs> you know it it may be better to have a truck loading and unloading uh, in a loading zone um, than uh, absolutely prohibiting it, and then it simply becomes just as illegal to park in a traffic lane as it is to unload in a, in a loading zone. I don't know. I just throw that out. That loading and unloading doesn't mean you can do any sorting. Yeah. Um, you have to actively be moving something from the truck to something or, or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, I raise it as a question. Uh, data made me think when she uh, made that point about, you know, does it really need to be off the street? I, I don't know the answer to that. That's, that's all I'm saying. I don't know the answer to that. Well, I think. If you want to just draw a poll, how many, let's find out first before we continue on. How many people on the committee think we should need to get it off the streets and sidewalk? And you can just speak up. I, I wasn't I'll disputing the sidewalk, just the street. Oh, definitely. I would agree. I sidewalk, the 100%. Sidewalk yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I just want committee members. Okay. So I, I'll call on them if that makes it easier. If Jess, if you want to go first. I would say certainly off the sidewalk, um, but not prepared to say 
categorically off the street. I didn't ask that. Is it a problem? Um, I guess you could say it's a problem, yes, but it's not necessarily um, it's not nece necessarily the solution to get rid of it completely. Okay, and that's why none of these say that. Yeah, yeah. I, that I, I agree with the last speaker. Uh, definitely off the sidewalks. I'm uh, unsure how I feel about the uh, the streets because of other problems that it might take up, but uh, definitely off the sidewalks. And uh, thank you. Sure, and Mimi. Yeah, I think it should be off the streets and sidewalks. I've seen a lot of sorting on the streets, like in the rain, and it <sighs> it just seems miserable. I think it would be nicer for um, the workers if they weren't having to do it in the street and the sidewalk. It's it's just not the best spot for. Um, because we're trying to like walk around. Yeah, no, I, and, and Patrick? Definitely off the sidewalk. And um, I think, as Jeff pointed out, it's called the travel lane, but definitely not in there, which you see on Maiden Lane and Fulton Street. But Betty, if there was, this might be like a. Wait, Mitch, let's go with hands only. Oh, I thought you said no hands. You could just for, for this thing. Well, with this, but you've already spoken. So I just want to move on to let Patrick speak, and then we're going to go okay. on to Cody. Sure. And then Eric. I didn't speak. Because I didn't get to your name on the list yet. Yes, so I, I, I was just saying off, off the sidewalk and um, out of the travel lanes. Okay, Cody. Off the sidewalk and certainly not blocking bike lanes or other through fairs. Good point. Point. But is there any way of restricting it to the few places you aren't naming, which is parking? In fact, if they haven't successfully been able to restrict them, if they're on the street, they're on the street. On the street. So I think, you know, ultimately it would be great to have them off the street too. But um but I don't think you'll see enforcement. I mean, we don't see it. That's now. not the issue. The issue is is it a problem? It is it can be, yes. It has been for me. Eric? Uh, yes, it's a problem on the sidewalk and on the street. Um, for the street, I understand they need to load, but it shouldn't be ours. See, that's the difference between the truck. It should be incidental. So it is a problem for me on the street and on the sidewalk. Yeah, and you're right. It's multifaceted is, is the issue. Uh, and Vendetta? Yeah, so I... I do not see it as a, I would not support this statement taking delivery sorting and staging off the streets. I do not. I, when I've looked a lot at these micro delivery centers, they're getting the boxes out. They're putting them on hand trucks. They've got like 20 people there who are at work and then walk maybe within a half mile radius. Like, um, I think it's actually a good system from what I've seen. I see it in Midtown, they use the floating parking. They use also the, the spot in the floating parking behind the, the truck. So it's in the parking, it's where it's supposed to be. It's not in the bike lane, it's not in the travel lane. They're able to get that space because that is paid parking. So, uh, and they don't, I guess they don't have as much placard abuse in some of these areas. So I see it working well there. So I wouldn't want to say that we have to take it off the streets because just like I think we never could envision people sitting in a restaurant enclosure in the parking lane, but now that happens. So I think with vision, there, there could be a way to have these micro distribution centers on the street because I think sometimes that's gonna be the most efficiency even for all those workers so that they, <laughs> They don't have to like walk down a helix ramp into a garage and try to pull up a hand truck and it would, you know, would triple their work. So I, I mean, I suppose there's a lot of different models out there, but I just wouldn't want to say that, that the model of doing it on the streets is one that we're not going to look at. Okay. So we have one person is okay with sorting and, and leaving things on the street, but otherwise it looks like the majority is saying it's a general problem that needs some solutions. 
So we should be able to move forward with looking at the solutions. So if Tammy, if you'd like to go and then Justine and uh, Mitch, you can, and Pat. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go with my preference would be off the street, because if you provide an opportunity for them to be off the street, overflow will end up on the street anyway. Yes. <laughs> We have so many other uses that we're looking for. It'd be great to find a place, you know, if there was more available, if, if that takes some of the burden off the commercial parking, that could then lower also the double parkers of all other kinds. So anything that we can do that kind of spreads it around to a different direction, I'm 100% in favor of. I wanted to also mention when we're looking at this, where you have, um, Okay, uh, repurposing at least parts of enclosed parking structures for e commerce. I would like to know. I, we are talking about 1 of the things. I, I think we need to be a little bit more. Definitive only enclosed and I wouldn't call them parking structures. I would call them accessory and commercial parking facilities. Right? Because we don't need a separate structure. Like, I'm not looking for a battery garage in places. I'm looking for accessory and commercial because that would cover a lot of our mixed use or, for example, a residential or commercial building can be accessory. And sometimes many of those places, like I think of 20 Liberty in particular, have buckets of service elevators. Right? And with the 1 of the things that was still discussed at, um. You know, widely in the media is, although people are coming back to work, they may be here 3, 4 days a week. And we have a glut. We have so much extra office space right now that they're converting it to residential. Mm -hmm. And within the cosmic concept, when we start to take a look at that and those conversions, there exists potentially opportunities to take some of that accessory parking with the conversion of a building and really do a greater good conversation. So my sentence syntaxing would be only enclosed accessory and commercial facility parking facilities because that gives you a lot of the opportunity and um yeah and i'll stop there thank you yeah thank you for your word help you and, called me next is that okay uh yes and then we'll go to mitch because he's a committee member and then pat Okay. Um, oh, I sorry, one second. Can we have Lucian? Do you have something to say to clarify? Oh, yeah, I was just just what um, what Ted was talking about uh, being in favor. I was just going to jump in and just say one way to. Put the language if you decide to would be, you know, that there, you know, a deliberate organized. Kind of program for the, the sorting, because um, I think that's what that's what's missing is that there's no deliberate acknowledgement of the act of sorting packages on, in, within the public right of way. Um, and that's what would have to be defined and and incorporated if the committee were to move to support such a thing. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. I mean, if, if it said strongly supports wait, researching. Wait, 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 Dana, okay. Justine was interrupted, so. She has to go back to her. I, I actually am gonna follow up with what Dana said and that I, and you're saying what I'm going to say. So I know it's not, I'm not on the committee, but what I would be strongly supporting is, to, is taking it off the sidewalk, both staging and sorting. But I would be, I'm hearing what everybody's saying. I think that perhaps a separate, therefore, be resolved without saying strongly supports, but Manhattan Community Board one, um, It kind of encourages more research into staging and sorting off the streets because we're not there yet. But again, that's my feeling. I think I agree with Detta with it's my feeling. What Lucian said doesn't satisfy me about the street. Sidewalk 100%. So I guess the part that bothers me is strongly supports taking delivery and sorting off the streets. So if you water it down when it comes to the streets, I think it needs to be mentioned. So I'm not saying it doesn't need to be there. You need to say something and as we've got other options, we should look at it. That's all. 
Uh, yeah, and keep in mind, it, that is implied there are other options because otherwise, de facto, you are, that's why they do it now, because there aren't other options. Yeah, no, I, I don't like it. Prefer it to be in the streets in some places, not in the drive, not in the, not in the, you know, not in the bike lane, not in the, the traffic, but maybe in a parking space, perhaps. But it really depends in different places in the neighborhood where it would make sense. And there's places in FIDI where it's totally not possible. There's no way for it to, for, for it to function as we know and we've heard. So that's why I'm saying research, but I'm not in the minute of writing or writing, you know, of suggesting the language. I just don't strongly support it off the streets. Okay, Mitch, you were next and then Pat. Well, thank you. I actually, I agree with most everything of, of that you have here, Betty, and this might not be a realistic suggestion, but if you have any opinions about it, uh, you know, if there was a way to kind of induce the street parking for these uh, delivery of vehicles, into like the areas where there's mostly placard parking where regular people like, that have to just you know stop to do shopping or just visit a person you know that that uh, have to stop at a meter for a half an hour for an hour or two you know uh if there was a way to induce the places where most of the most people can't park anyway because of the placards uh, streets where we know there are placard parking uh then it could be a win-win situation, getting some of those uh, delivery vans off the streets that, that impact the regular neighbors and, uh, you know, uh, where we where people can't park anyway. So uh, it might not be a realistic suggestion, but I was just wondering how you, you know, <laughs> if there was a way to induce, uh, like, uh, on, in, on those blocks, you know, where people know that it's just placard parking. Yeah, you're right. It's not realistic. Uh, but well, you'll see some points later why, why it isn't, but those... Placards have been promised space. Right. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Pat? Oh, I'm strongly in favor of getting it off the streets, mainly because of the quality of life impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not talking about the amount of noise that's involved. Again, Daron said that, you know, his building, and in particular, he's speaking for his, his apartment, the 34 Cliff, the Cliff Street parking lot, they not only ha are paying for the lot to be used, but then they encroach the sidewalk and the middle of the street. So, and, and they're out there yelling and another neighbor has said she's been cursed out when she asked them to please move and let her be able to walk down the street. So it's, it's a quality of life issue getting them off of the sidewalk. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's move on to the next portion of the resolution be a further result that the city of New the DOT ensure that our district's limited streetscape is allocated in a way that allows safe movement of all users, especially as the number and width of cargo bikes making deliveries increases. Because there is a big push for more e-cargo bikes. Again, to get away from trucks and vans. It's no, it's not creating more vehicles, just different combinations. Okay, and the next one. We would also need to have in our district a network of roads and bike lanes that safely accommodate cargo delivery bikes without displacing the growing number of cyclists and users of micro transportation that need protected space. So again, I, if you've ever seen some of even the uh, Amazon bikes on a bike lane, they really take up the whole bike lane. So as you get more and more cargo bikes, you'd say nobody can ride by bicycle. So where are the city bikes going to go? Where are the personal vehicle bikes going to go? So we do want to preserve the rights of individuals to use bikes as well. And next, any plan adopted should include, increase, include increasing the transportation of cargo by motor vehicle from Pier 6 or any marine delivery location in our district to areas outside of our district, which would increase congestion, pollution, and noise burden on our district. So we don't want to increase the transportation by motor vehicle. Because why do we want them coming in here to go to, to, to truck them around to other districts as well? Not really. So if people have things to say about wording, 
I welcome it and Eric, please speak and then Mitch. Hold on, Betty. I just want you to be aware. This is EDC. I have to put my hand down. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. ED, I just want you to be aware that is, I believe, part of their plan from EDC with the redevelopment in the, of lower Manhattan. That it is so. Anybody who wants to argue against this should know that this is where we need to stick our head in. Yes, is what kind of vehicles and how many vehicles? And yes, this wording looks rough to me, but nevertheless. Uh, Eric? Uh, yeah, um, this was on the previous, uh, be it further resolved sure. that. Um, I, I have a concern or, or both a concern and a preference that if these delivery vehicles are going to go to four feet, they need to be licensed. That's a motor vehicle. <laughs> and if they're, especially if they're going to take a travel lane, I, I, I don't want them to be, they need to pay their fair share of, 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 um, of uh, user fees, because if they're going to be taking more with and taking up a, a officially required to take a, a lane, um, they, they're motorized vehicles. Yeah, uh, don't worry about it here, because unfortunately, it's again state law, which hasn't been passed, so we can't opine on something that's not even being discussed yet. But if it goes to 48 inches, as was suggested, it still would fall under the purview. It depends. Does it fall under the purview of the law as a bike, or does it fall under the purview of the law as a motor vehicle? And that we don't know because the law is not written. But that's um, the problem right now with the 36 inch in those is that they're defined as bicycles in New York state. And so they can't be motor vehicle. <laughs> just um, by definition. Okay. They wow. They're really saving a lot of money that way. Uh, being, being classified as such. And then with the other, be it further resolved, the, the one that you just had, um, I, I, the last one concerned about say, stipulating specifically pier six. I, I, I don't know. Shouldn't we. I'm, I think that we should let them decide. I, I don't know if Pier Six is has a good use as it is as a, as a heliport. Uh, yeah. So, I, but I, that's just my side comment on 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 the Pier Six. Oh yeah, this was only about Pier Six because it's been named already okay. as being looked at it. But the point is, and that's why it says or any other marine delivery location in our district. Uh, that we don't want vehicles trans being transported outside of our district. Okay, we that's don't want to just have. be an entry point. So, yeah, I know your point's well taken, but this was getting after. We don't want to be an entry point for all of Manhattan to be bringing cargo in. And yes, Tammy, I'll work with you on the wording and Lucian because we can smooth that out to make it clearer. Uh, Detta, uh, Detta and oh, Lucian, did you have clarification? And then Detta? Yeah, I just wanted to, I know Tammy mentioned it once, but I think it bears repeating that um, the, the, the finite seaport uh, uh, concept uh, may you know, really redefine uh, what the shoreline looks like, including uh, what piers are there, uh, what piers remain, what piers are re reestablished, and what they do. Um, I, one thing I wanted to just say so everyone understands is that the Pier 6, the heliport, is operated by EDC. It is one of the reasons why EDC has a lot of independence because EDC controls city assets and then uses them to generate income, which funds the operations of EDC and EDC programs. So EDC will certainly want to keep whatever use of Pier 6 or its equivalent in the future. EDC will certainly seek to keep uh, uh, it, it, it as an income generating asset. So just I, I remember some people are saying, well, we don't want to let them use it for free. I don't think that will ever be the case. And I just wanted to kind of link all that together with this opportunity. Thanks, Betty. Yeah, thank you, Lucian. And Dana, if you'd like to speak and. Could you put up the uh, the first part of the resolution? With the, the bulleted with list? The bullets, yeah, because this is. This is just, I love the resolution. I love all the B for the results. It's just this one for me. I can't say I support these things. I don't know if they would work, but I would strongly support investigating these options or researching these options or moving towards these options. But I can't just say strongly supports because I don't actually know if some of those are good ideas. 
So that's that's all. Okay, well, would people like to move forward with a resolution? Ms. Committee members and Tammy, I see your hands. <laughs> uh, I, when we're talking about uh, delivery, I want to make sure that um, I remember somewhere, and, I, and I'm losing my marbles on which one it was, was any New York City doc? Where was that verbiage of New York City? It was in Mark Levine's, I think. City owned docs. Um, I think that there needs to be a line in there to call for the city to work with non city owned docs. And the reason why I say that is the city does not own every doc in CB1. And what I would not like to see is any usage of a doc within CB1. For example, the Brookfield Pier, anything on Huntington River Park Trust, or anything remotely like that, or any of the new docks that are out there um, that will be built because there will be uh, several, according to the uh, Lower Manhattan Climate Coalition. Um, and ownership of those docks are a little fuzzy. So I'd like to add some verbiage in there about that. And, yeah, no, I and and your city owned vehicle or city issued placard. I'd like it to say city or state because we have city, state, and federal. So, what about government? Love that. Sounds good. You, you're right because around me there are a lot of federal all the time. Thank you. Yes. Okay, then we'll make that change as well as I will look at how to work with all the other docs and places where they will work on verbiage for that. I think it's going to need probably a whereas as well as be it further resolved because it is a whole different ask. So for people who are voting to know there would be another addition to have New York City work with all private and other all docks in places where freight could enter from water that are not owned by New York City. And the last before the vote, let's hear from Jeff, Patrick, and Mariama. Um, on this slide here, um, I think, I hate to say it again, but data always makes me think. Um, the, the, uh, the preamble strongly supports. I think it would be easier for board members as a whole to support language that says so strongly supports investigating wow. these things. Uh, How about like in principle? Strongly supports the principles of? Supports in principle. In principle. Investigating is just investigating is getting time. nowhere. Yeah, you're just wasting time, and who's going to pay for it? Oh, and who's going to tolerate that, doing it? I, I, I disagree with that, but um, I, I would accept something uh, uh, not as soft as investigating, uh, because after all, that's what we're asking for: is the investigation of all of these points. I mean, I, I think that one of the themes that has gone through this discussion is that we're not quite sure whether these objectives are obtainable and we're asking for a study to see whether they are obtainable. Um, but anyway, I, 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 I would, I think I would support the language strongly supports. No. It would be, it would be Manhattan Community Board one in principle supports. That, that I could support. Was what Jess was recommending and would change yeah. to. Yes, yes. I, one of the things that I was uh, taught when I first started doing legal writing was try to avoid unnecessary adverbs. Um, and um, the word strongly, the adverb strongly uh, carries with it all sorts of mischief. Um, but uh, 
supports the principles of I, I would support. Getting into good trouble, Jeff. That's what community boards do. Good. <laughs> yes. yes, but I've already changed it on my copy, so it's you know yes. That's Not fine. That's, that, that's fine. Support. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the spirit of this is is, is exactly right. Great, and Patrick, Miriam, we'll hear another legal voice. And one thing I was taught by my favorite judge is don't bore us, get to the chorus. I'm going to call the question, please. Okay, I second it. I second it. Okay, Lucian, do you want to vote? Or do you want me to hold the vote? But you call the vote. Thank you. I really didn't want to, but okay. Anyone opposed? I will. This will be an affirmative vote. You'll be assumed yes unless you vote one of the other ways. So you are there still any debate of those? It, Betty. I didn't mean to cut off debate by any means. I'm just trying to get us to a point where we can. No. No. Calling the question means ending debate. Well, it just means moving it to the floor. But oh, okay. I think only Mariama wanted to speak. Should we just let her say what she wants to say? I can hold John up at the full board. It's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> speak, Mary Emma. No, no, do it now. That's what it means. No, speak. Do it now. I, I mean, I definitely think that if we're asking for a study, uh, some yeah. people may be satisfied by um, what was the word you just put in principle. Um, but the the way that it is on the screen is implicit of already supporting the outcome of a study that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and so I do think that's dangerous. Yeah, I don't want to make it clear the study is not mentioned in here at all. So I don't want to, people to say later it's misleading because no one's talking about a study. That CB1 in principle supports means the idea the, knowing the, that. The, the things, president well, has well, one second, wait, one second, please. Because in principle, these things aren't known quantities. They're, everything is new. It's just the idea is good. That doesn't mean it couldn't turn out to not be as wonderful when you look at all the details, which is why a lot of these things are going to individually get their own resolutions. That's all. Uh, so just to clarify. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, I'm not sure it's a good idea to say the idea is good before, if the borough president is proposing a study, which basically is meaning to investigate something to see if it is good, we're already implying that we are satisfied with the outcome, that we, we strongly agree that it is good before he's looked into it. So that's my only, you know, what, what I'm adding here and what I would imagine a lot of other non-members of transportation um, may suggest at the full board. May, so I make I, a, may I make a syntax suggestion? Please. Including what Mariama is saying that, you know, that CB1 strongly supports the borough president who is looking to study things that may result in the following outcomes. That gets everything that we're asking for, and I'm going to pass the solution. Sorry, I mean, the cough right to your ears, uh, right when I unmute. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've been on the the business side of this, I, I just remind people, I, I used to work for uh, Gail. I was her policy person for small business and um, well, economic development and, and technology. And I, I've been part of the drafting of, of, of more than one bill on um, this past and uh, as a result of a, of, a, of a study that we've done. And I will say that uh, success comes at different speeds for different things uh, based on what a borough president uh, put out there, uh, depending on how warm the administration is, uh, how warm the, the commissioners may be, and maybe what resources or, or, or things may happen in the news. Uh, what I would say is that if the administration called Mark tomorrow and said, "Hey, look, we want to we want to do a, a zoning text amendment for the accessory uses of a garage as part of our citywide thing." Um, I don't think that the borough president would say, well, let's, let's wait until the study's done. Let's make it part of whatever EIS is to be done for the zoning text amendment. Um, so I, I do think some of these things will certainly need to be studied. And some of these things, the study may be moved into a different package uh, uh, if the wheels start turning quicker than are anticipated. So, you know, I would just assume for, for argument's sake that this is the study and, and we are we are either saying that um, these principles 
should move to the next phase where we could evaluate how they're uh, 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 implemented or proposed to be implemented once that time comes. Uh, but I, I don't think that we should assume that there's going to be another follow up study for everything. That's all. Yeah, thank you. And it, it, that's why some of these things, such as the marine vessels versus large trucks making deliveries, that is a study that's going to be going on. But there are other things, such as making it illegal to park in loading zones with city owned, well, government owned vehicles, uh, is not going to be a study. And I don't know how many people feel it really needs to be a study before you figure out. Yeah, really. Well, yeah, I didn't mean to suggest that everything needed to be a study, but if, for example, with the, the item that you suggested is going to be a study, um, is going to be a study, in fact, then we're already saying we strongly support it before it's been studied is the only thing. So our, our statement that we strongly support everything listed here, it's implicit that we need we a study, we need not a study. Because yeah, we've already no, decided no, wait, we strongly wait, wait. support it. Yeah, Maria, I mean, let's get to the wording that we're talking about. Strongly cut that out of the vocabulary because it's not in that sentence. It's in theory support. In principle okay. supports. That means if it works out, so in principle, it sounds like a good idea, hence it's worth studying. It is implicit in that comment. And that's why Jess, I think, made that suggested word change okay. that was accepted. So it's yes, in principle supports. And Jess, unless you can change it on the screen with that slide, uh, even if I do, you'd have to refresh it. Yeah, it's a PDF, so I don't want to mess with it. Okay, I'll leave it because I can change. Oh, I did already change it here mm -hmm. on my computer. So yes, sorry, I can't change question. it for your screen. Call the question. Just keep moving. <laughs> yes, are there any nays? Are there any recusals? Any abstentions? But did I hear somebody say something? I just want, I'm sorry, but I turn my camera on, uh, or my microphone on, I just I want to remind everyone who's voting to turn their cameras on, please. Yeah, Mitch, I don't see your camera on. I'm going, to the camera. I'm, going to, I'm going to mark it as uh, no camera, which is essentially not voting or yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to call the cameras on. Okay. Okay. Cause there were no abstentions, no, no's, no. Accusals. Okay. Thanks everyone. Yes. Thank you. So we can go on to, and we'll make those word changes. What I want to tell everybody is to try to Tammy, you can thank me later to try to not happen. What happened last time. Uh, we'll get this resolution draft finalized better and sent out. So you have a week or so to look at it before the meeting. Please make comments back to Lucian or myself. Both of us would be better. Uh, okay. Email and we can kind of address some of those issues in advance. So we don't take up so much time at full board. Because nobody wants to spend an hour on just one resolution, really. So let's get to see if we can close up one other, the last of our street co-naming. So thank you all for working on this. And that is what community output should be sought. And we worked on this last month. So next slide. Got more thought and input into this. If you recall last time, the one request from Kerry was that we renumber things so that it mimics other portions. We are not talking about item number one at all. That is about what the applicant puts in about the nominee. So that is not the discussion for today. Two and three do come up because the way it sits right now is that the resident, they're going to tell us how many residences and businesses there are. You have to get signatures on, uh, I hate them, uh, petitions for up to 75% of the residents or businesses. So it's very formulatic. And people weren't terribly satisfied with that. So an alternative to that, you go to the next slide. We 
kind of recapped, we found out from the census data collection how difficult it is to enter many of the buildings in our district, which makes it very burdensome to collect signatures on a petition. It also creates the problems in the courthouse district. Who signs? Because nobody lives there. Petitions are also a flawed method, even if you can get signatures, because the CB1 office cannot confirm the signatures. They cannot confirm if the signees are really supportive or just signed because someone stuck something in their face or where the signee lives. So we really have very little information and a big burden placed on our office if we think they could even try to do it. So those are the problems with having petitions that we spoke about last month. So the difficulty and the number of signatures would vary greatly depending on the neighborhood and the block. So I wanna tell you this inspired one of our members who is actually on a business trip this month, Carrie Davidson, and she looked into what other community boards do, <laughs> this perturbed her. And she said the CB3 also uses 75% support threshold, uh, but they do not have a verification process and they do not require that it be an adult that sign. Uh, they set a floor and a ceiling on the number of residential signatures, depending on the residential size and the block. So it has to be at least 150 signatures on what they define as a small block, which is less than 200 residential units. And it has to be 75% from blocks with more than 200 residential units, but capped at 500 signatures. They're really into numbers. Now, if the committee feels that the applicants deserve a clear and measurable standard, then she gets into, we have to get around the problem of securing the signatures on a petition and the difficulty of verifying those signatures is still a problem. So we don't know what the signatures mean anyway. CB2 takes a whole different approach that I don't even really wanna talk about, but they presume denial of all applications unless the applicant can prove otherwise, <laughs> overcome that denial, which is an interesting approach. And again, they don't, they just talk about substantial numbers of signatures. So they don't define numbers in any way, shape or form. So again, a very different method. And I hope no one here is looking at negative. We've gone so far into affirmative that if somebody passes the thresholds that they can potentially be acceptable, but they have to meet the criteria. So the alternative, spoke with Lucian about some of the feasibility with the office to do it, and that would be to have the applicant post signs on a one block radius, the proposed co-name, with the information about the proposed co-name and how to comment. And I understand this is very much like the liquor license uh, people opening, looking for a liquor license, kind of do the same thing to notify neighbors. They would also have to have the method of contact and the process would be, they can send emails or letters to the CB1 office and we can decide if there needs to be a requirement of just how many signatures do we care. Uh, and the next step, there would be a public hearing at transportation committee meeting one month after the committee hears the proposal and the committee votes that the application should move forward. So if again, like the last one we had, we came to a draw, so that would have stopped the process no matter what. If the committee had passed the resolution, then they would say, okay, next month we're gonna have a public hearing to let people from the public speak to your application. And then we'll vote on that before taking it to full board, which would be the last step in the process. Okay, this would allow comments of support and concern could occur simply because it's going would appear on the agendas for both the committee meeting as well as for full board that the street co name was coming up if it was appropriate. So there would be no soliciting, which was a concern of people. We don't want to make it like that we're soliciting negative input, but it would allow people who have current concerns to make contact if they choose to. So what do people think of this modification suggestion compared to based on the complaints, concerns that were made last month? And Patrick, welcome to. Thanks, Betty. Um, so acknowledging that I wasn't um, present for last month's discussion when I was preparing and, and read about the 75% threshold thinking, I, I just thought to myself that is an, an almost impossible 
yeah. barrier to meet, a uh, burden to meet. It's a, it's effectively um, an embargo on street code namings, which look, I'm fine with, because I think it's an honorific that time has passed. And I think it's a dopey thing that we do anymore, but, um, but acknowledging that we, that the city council is going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, we, we, we should have some um, say in that process. And I think realistically, if we had that 75% threshold, we would have no say in the city council process. So I think what you proposed here is an alternative as they listen to you going through it. It's a really nice balance between, you know, sort of the just giving notice and seeing how it goes method versus, you know, really trying to actively engage people, but not placing a burden on on active engagement not certainly not placing some high arbitrary metric around it so i think it's a nice approach thank you yeah no i think that's that's the important part is to be fair and realize that within the last month or two um, our council person chris marte has put forward and gotten past two street co-naming so where we've been neutral or even negative they've gone through anyway so I think the point of being fair is important. And remember, we did change the barriers a bit. We did make it, we confirmed how many years there needed to be of service. We also added that there had to be 20 years post the passing away if it was an individual. So some of the, those kind of restrictions are in place and would be there. For some of the limiting. Sorry, could you say the years again? I, at the last part, the twenty years since what? It's twenty years since if it's for the individual, it's twenty years since the person passed away. If it is for an individual, they must have thirty years of community involvement in the district. If it is an organization, it's twenty years of involvement. Thank you. So those are built into those individual categories there is no such category there are no such restrictions like that on historical events but again they have to be historical events Derek? Uh, yeah hi um as I, I mentioned previously i i don't i agree that maybe we have to fine-tune it a little bit and i do like this alternative proposal on on how to get feedback but i i definitely don't want the threshold to to be too high um, I, I, I don't see the real need for scrutinizing this so much. I don't see this as a problem. Um, I, it, it's, it's only, it's honorific and I, and the city council represent a uh, city council person will do it anyway. Um, I, I, I don't see much of a need for this, except maybe fine tuning it, maybe updating the way based on current forms of communication, but I, I don't see a need for, for doing this. So you agree with this alternative where I have no numbers put in on the number of emails or letters or. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, but then, like but, notifying people if they can, if they want to. Yeah, to give them a chance, other people, if they have a different opinion on. Right. Yeah, but then I, when you mentioned the 30 years, uh, 30 years of service and then 20 years post, you know, after the person passes away, is that what you said that they, they need? 30 yes, years those are the ones we've passed in past months. Wow, uh, that 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 that's pretty. Uh, <laughs> that that really narrows it down. Okay. Actually, it doesn't, as much as you'd think. There are a lot of community board members who could meet those thresholds. Okay. Thanks for your input, Tammy. And I'm sorry, Lucian, to clarify, and then Tammy. Yeah, I, <clears throat> thank you, Betty. I think that you know one thing I just wanted to add is. Um, I, I, I like the alternative and one of the things I would only add uh, to what you put here is that uh, by uh, having a first pass uh, with the committee for the committee to say, you know, it could be a, a real stinker and just it stops right there. Um, but then allowing it to be the following month for the public hearing portion, it will allow the office to um, post notice on its own via the newsletter, via social media. So we, we could really get the word out um, far and wide about uh, a public hearing. So supporters and opponents uh, would all ha have an idea of where and when they need to be and, and what, what to say. So you, this has that the applicant would come to the committee 
which can either vote for or against at that particular one to move forward or not is really what it is. If they're going to move forward, the next step would be the next month. Are you saying that should be longer than a month? No, no, no. I, I, what I'm saying is that you take an internal vote of whether or not to proceed right. with the application, and that gives the office time to notify via its own means of communication the greater community that there is a hearing and that people should come and, and make comment if they're so moved to do so. And so I, I think that we we don't usually have, usually people find out either at the very last minute about something. <laughs> That's what we find, you know, with like liquor licensing, we'll have people kind of um, uh, uh, breathlessly email or call the office the day of the licensing committee. Like, well, I can't make it, but this is what I would say if I could come. Uh, instead, you give people a month to say, you know, this is moving forward. Um, it's been on the agenda. We'll have been on the agenda two different times. So more, most people should be able to make whatever sort of schedule accommodations to come and 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 be present or send us uh, their commentary so we can kind of summarize it or tabulate it before the meeting. So I, I, that's what I like about the alternative. Yeah, thank you. And I want to let you know too that well, Lucian already knows this, but for everybody else, the off will will work with the office to put together the sign or my. Mo model sign that would be posted so that the applicant has an easier for what needs to be filled in to be individualized to their particular application. But as far as the, the information that needs to be done in the time frame, we can get that done through the office to help them out. So it's more standardized. And these are so seldom that I would even set up a, a, a Google form and create a QR code that they could put on it uh, just so we have like a centralized place for all commentary you know, so we can do things like that because it's 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 not like a fire hose of of applications, and we can we can be very um, precise and and uh, deliberate with how we treat it. Thank you. So yes, I will smooth out some of that. But Tammy, apologies. Um, quick question: We're removing the number that's required right that's what it yes. says is We're there, removing it. okay so then my question becomes is there anything unlike what jeff or patrick has said is there an adverb adjective that we would put in there instead because i do think there should be something if we're if the number of signatures would vary depending on neighborhood and block I don't know. I mean, is five signatures enough? I, you know, it, that doesn't, I think, really work. I think one of the problems is that we do need something there, and I'm sorry to disagree with you on that, but I mean, you need some kind of person. I think you need something to show that it has local and community support. What are you going to make people do? I mean, where do you count? And how are you going to verify that those people are the people that you want? Can they have somebody from California write an email? But you know what? On a petition, you're supposed to put an address anyway. Well, I can make up an address. I mean, this has been this has been def defended all the time with actually there's a Republican Party going after it more with voter rolls. But nevertheless, this has been an issue over and over again with petitions. Oh, yeah. I mean. I think Mariama can speak to that probably better than anybody, uh, you know, and, and Patrick through their roles in the democratic political process. But all I'm saying is that if a petition has, I, I don't want to call anybody a liar or not, or be the ones to check, but there should be, I think, a large level of community support. Otherwise, we're in the same position we were before. And Eric, I am sorry you were not here, but were there renaming streets that have no relevance, no connection necessarily, or even if it does, maybe the local community does not want it renamed. But then they need to respond to this. A coning. Well, I just think that the, the, I think the burden of proof to show local support should not be on the community board, it should be on the applicant. And so while taking a number away, I understand it's difficult, but they have to, I think that, I think there has to be an effort in there. I'm sorry. 
Let's hear what other people say. Because again, effort, you know, how much effort and for what? Because again, the court, the civic center is very different where there may not be any residences. But that doesn't make a difference to me. Then they should have to show that, right? They should have to show there are only, you know, 500 residential units in this five block radius. And I, and I have. X it's only one block radius. Or whatever the case is, you, if there's zero residents, then that's one thing. But that doesn't apply in any other neighborhood. And I think since we're making it one rule for the whole district, you can make a rule that says they have to have X percentage of signatures of the residential units and just move on from there. That is my personal. Okay, yeah, let's go back to signatures because again, the committee so far has been kind of against that. But so let's, Detta had her hand up first. So we'll go to Detta and then Jess and then Mitch. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Tammy on this. Um, while 75% of everybody in a one block radius may be too high of an amount, I feel like there needs to be some, some amount of support that we're asking for. So like some quantifiable number of emails and letters that we want Why? to receive. That's it. Okay, thanks, Jess. Mitch, Mariama. I, I agree that the burden should be on the applicant, but I, I just think that when we get into like any quantitative level that we set, to me is just going to be kind of arbitrary and impossible to verify. So, you know, if there's a proposal, for example, and it comes before the, the board and we didn't receive any letters in support, you know, we can, we can vote it down. I mean, it, the, the board is capable of, you know, making these calls. I think it doesn't have to be so rigid and I think it should, it would just be arbitrary to, to set such a strict standard. So, you know, I, it's, we don't get a ton of these, so I don't see why it can't just be a case by case basis and the board decides. Yes, we have. Hmm? During Margaret Chin's last year, we got a bucket of them. What's a bucket? Like, was it was it overwhelming? Well, I think Lu Lucian said last last time that it was like a couple that we get every year or something like that. Like I said, they have city council has passed ones that we've rejected. They've passed ones that we've been neutral on, and they've passed ones that we have supported. So. They are their own independent body anyway, and they want the counts. So the question for the committee is really how much, given the other barriers of information that needs to be done and service that needs to be done, does the committee really have enough to vote on when it's out there for public comment and it is publicized in the same way that liquor licenses are? To let the community know. So again, Mitch. Okay, uh, I actually I I agree with you, Betty, on this. Uh, I just I, I was actually going to respond in in what you had said. There are some uh, areas like you know where the courthouses are, where you're not going to be able to get you know anybody that lives right there, and you know people that work there. They're not all. They're not invested in in the community. It's it's not like you know the mom and pop candy store when I was growing up in the Bronx and and the guy lived on top of the store. So uh, I I think you know if if there were five signatures in support of something, I think reasonably that would be taken with a grain of salt, and I think holistically would be the best way to 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 go. And uh, I also think that uh, while putting uh, uh, displaying it like like the liquor license thing within a one block radius. But as far as signatures, I, I, I think it should be expanded to a little bigger area in the district because, you know, most of the businesses, the people don't live in the district. They go home to the suburbs and, you know, everybody is not invested. And there are people, especially in the fair market buildings where, you know, the same person that's lived here now is not going to be here in 20 years, uh, you know, due to like that other restriction that, that, that is put in this thing. So I, I would keep it more holistic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we'll go with the, you say you'd go with the alternative. 
Right. And, 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 and also to, uh, to kind of go along with what Eric had said before, I know I was kind of outvoted last month, uh, you know, where like the 20 years was kind of a, uh, a middle ground between the 50 year proposal, which, which I thought was like outrageous to what I was thinking, like, you know, the five, 10 years. And I think the 20 years was, while I still think it's, it's too much, you know, especially if somebody's, you know, 60, 70 years old, they might not be here in 20 years to see their, their, uh, their family member, you know, like get that. But, uh, uh, I think that's a, you know, a high threshold, but I think that we, we, we debated that last month. So I'll, I'll leave it like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was a decision. They have a little bit of perspective right. of, the, of the value. Right. I, I was outvoted on that one. Thank you. Yeah. Mary Alma, since I'd said before, and then Mimi. I agree with Tammy on this too. And I just wonder if you can't come up with a number, maybe you could use a word that, you know, you can equate with, like with a quote, with a quantifier, uh, you know, um, a majority, a preponderance, uh, something okay. that, uh, of support before we move forward. Because I think even in some of the areas where there's not necessarily a number of residents, there are attempts to name um, streets and uh, actually I got a call that I'll share with you. Um, a call asking me preemptively before any hearings, what I thought about a bridge by the battery tunnel, a small bridge being, um, named after a slave owner because his, uh, his slave was a spy that did good things for George Washington. And then, uh, you know, so something like that, for example, um, even if there's not residents, this, you're still going to get, had they moved forward without looking into it first, you're still going to get uh, rejection from uh, the community if, if they don't live on a particular block or something. So I, I do think that it matters that the majority should, you know, rule um, in these issues. Well, part of the reason that this was done was that the people on the block, I won't say they don't matter, but they certainly don't own the block. There are more people who could be offended or bothered by it. So this is why it was a posting in the area so that people who used that block that was going to be co-named would certainly see it. Otherwise, they don't use it very much since it would post mm -hmm. for a month. And they could respond positively or negatively because there has been and there is, a, as I said last month, there is a city council person who said he routinely rejects them because some people are opposed to the name, some are opposed some are opposed to that person for that location versus just the person mm -hmm. themselves. There are some people who are just plain opposed to any kind of co-naming and having a sign. This gives them all the opportunity in public engagement to say that. A uh, petition process doesn't. It allows the petitioner to go to only those who are positive. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with a petition, just with, with some sort of quantifier as it, you know, like, these two people didn't come and make the decision for these 10 people. You know what I mean? Um, well, but who are the 10 people? Our streets are used by a lot more than the people who live on the block. So that's why the post. That. No, that, that's well, that, that's a point well taken. That's true. Um, and, and so this was to know anyone who could be offended, who truly uses that block could make a comment because they would be aware of it. Which is why Lucian had also commented of having the time with uh, kind of getting the information out there that this is being heard for this particular honoree. Mm -hmm. and let people step forward if they want, which ha which happened with some yeah. of the Supreme Court nominations, for instance. A proper notice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess that that's fair enough. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, because the concern was targeting negative responses, which we didn't want to mm -hmm. do, but we want to notify for people to right. come in all directions. So Mimi, Patrick. Um, hey, I gotta go. I have to eat dinner. Um, and do you want to give your position on this one? Because again, this yeah. isn't something like a resolution. This is merely moving forward to next month, where hopefully we can look at the whole document. Yeah, I, I like putting posting signs. I think that that's, you know, an interesting concept. Um, I also think that putting it in their newsletter could be really helpful, like you know, in different avenues. Um, I. I think that the further we go down this co-naming road, the more confused and conflicted I get about it. So um, I think you're in the majority. 
Okay. But yeah, well, I, I do. Good. And again, keep in mind, this does not exclude the, com the committee at the time because it's going to change over time too. Could say, you know, this is a pretty good application, but why don't you show us more support? Get X number of signals. They could, they could add to it. This is the bare bones. Yeah, What's I just don't want it to turn into a wild goose chase, right? Like there was that nice family exactly. that had had somebody that seemed like really worthy of a co-naming um, or some sort of memorial, honestly, just like a memorial of some sort. And it, it seemed like um, they they reached all of the thresholds and they didn't really understand why they would need to go through all that trouble if if we were just like, we can't Google this guy. We don't know who he is. You know, it, it just seemed really sad. So, well, that's how we're trying to clarify the points yeah. of what we want, so the applicants know and they are not mis feel like they're misled. Yeah, totally. I gotta go. Um, thank you. So, but thank you so much. Yeah, take care. And Patrick. I just want to come back and and support point that Jess was making earlier about um, you know sort of taking these on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we can within this alternative framework, uh, Betty, that you proposed. We can, it, I think we're trying to solve um, from our end a, a problem from a metrics angle when, for example, the city council just looks at a purely political, it's a political thing. That's all it is, really. So, um, and, and I know we can't do that. So we, and, and in fairness to the applicants, we can't do that. So I don't think we need to go so far though as to set metrics around what is community support and what is not community support. I can't see the little block of, of screen on my phone right now, but I don't know if there's a way to put in there maybe, you know, uh, that the applicant shows community support or substantial community support or something like that. So, you know, um, reasonable community support. You can come up with a single adjective, I'm sure, if that is what would allay the concerns of those who want specific numbers around community support. But I think putting specific numbers around community support is going to set us up for failure by trying to solve this problem in a way that the city council is just not going to care. And it's just not the way that they're looking at this either. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And maybe that could be something put in to say that they, the applicant uh, demonstrate that there's reasonable community support. And again, that would let them kind of determine, do they want to do it with letters and emails? Do they want to yeah. do it with uh, having more people speak at these public hearings? A combination and then we can of determine, and then we can determine, oh, we know that, you know, section of the street. We know there's only three buildings there. Those 20 letters of support, my God, that's overwhelming community support. We know that's not an engaged block or something like that. We'll know. We'll be able to figure that out. Well, or that that is a very strong application, and right. if there's some apathy, there are no objections, that's, that may be considered strong enough. But Okay, so I think I'll find a way of working that into this. Yeah. Betty, could I, I, I think reasonable community support is a perfect way to, to put it, uh, and I, I, that, uh, so I, I totally agree with, with that, uh, that use of phrasing. Yeah, no, thank you. We'll do that. So again, that can be skewed to the, and the methods of doing that would be the email, the letters, or uh, speaking at the public hearing. Right. And reasonable, that, that's used in courthouses all the time, what a reasonable person would, would think in this situation that comes up in legal stuff all the time. So I think it works wonderful. Great. Okay. Well, then I will move forward with next month. We'll look at that and look at a more complete document to put it all together. This will be great. Now, oh, this is more of an announcement than anything else, but there is a permanent car share parking program. This is to show you the rule was passed, the DOT put it forward. Uh, it was passed on May 25th, and now they have come forward with asking, well, notifying us of some parking spaces that are going in for this car share parking. Next one, the DOT car share, what is it? It provides on-demand short-term access to shared fleet of vehicles, typically through a membership and an hourly fee. So in other words, it's, you're kind of renting a vehicle. The pilot program was launched by the DOT in June of 2018 with three companies that are supplying vehicles for on-street and municipal parking. We are only gonna be talking about the on-street ones being suggested at this time. What they found was an average of 24 trips per space and 17 households per vehicle, and I believe this was per month. So it was much greater use in individually owned vehicles. 
The pilot was viewed to be a success, hence it became permanent, as you saw on, on May 25th. And so I asked for more details, because you'll see the letter that came and it was kind of confusing. But they are asking for approximately 40 feet near a corner, and that's to accommodate two parking spaces. So go to next, this is with the letter. So I got to sort out these five locations and figure out where they were, and what they looked like. So we got more information about it. So if you go, I'll show you the five of them. If you go to the next one, you'll find out why it's misleading. In Tribeca, 21 J Street is actually two spaces on J Street by the northeast corner with Greenwich Street. So it's kind of where these two vehicles are located, would be set aside for car share parking. The next one in Tribeca also, 51 Vestry Street is actually two spaces on Washington Street near the southeast corner with Vestry Street. So it would be where these two vehicles are located. The next one, 22 River Terrace, this was even more confusing, is on River Terrace, but it's the northeast corner with Warren Street. And so this building that you see right here is actually 400 Chambers Street. Uh, it's on the other side of Warren Street is where 22 River Terrace is. So this is where the addresses became kind of confusing and we asked for specific information. The other location, one of the other locations, Battery Park City is 10 River Terrace. And again, this is actually two spaces on Murray Street by the southeast corner with River Terrace. So 10 River Terrace is actually, this is a side of it. It's where Poets House is. So it'll be where these two cars are located. And the third location in Battery Park City is at South End Avenue at the southwest corner with West Thames Street. So in front of where the old Gristides that's now closed is located. So, Mitch, then Mariama. Then Eric. I'm sorry, I, I put, just put my head down. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay, then let's start with Eric for committee and then Mariama. Yeah, I, I pardon. I, I I don't see the point of this 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 program. That's what I mean. Because um, I I have um, a membership to what what was it that car rental the car. So if if we need a car, we zip car. Zip, zip car. Thank car, you. Yeah. Thank you. They're they're in various um, parking lots. So, but with this program, they have these cars parked, designated at these spots and available for anyone who has a membership and who reserves it to use it. Correct. Right? And then right. that that space can be used by no one else. That is also right. <laughs> Only if they're so also from that company. There, oh. no, the, the cars, the cars tend to live there. The cars are named. Right. The cars will return to those spots. But it, the sign says this area is reserved for this car share, and it'll be like say like one or two spots. But then, if I were a member of of that, you know, with that for that car, and I go. For three hours, that means no one's allowed to park there, right? So we're wasting space, public space. Um, well, not really. Because nobody else can use it. Car. Nobody else could use it. That, that, I mean, that's what I'm meaning. Nobody else can use it when I'm using the car to some day, day trip. So no one else can use it. Eric, I, I can give a little bit of uh, experience. I live uptown. We have a, a number of these uptown for many years. Uh, this is just a recent expansion downtown. After the pilot program was completed, um, these these cars tend not to be used um, for 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 the day. They're what, what what we see is that they're actually turned over after every couple of hours. So you'll see these you'll see a lot of turnover in the, during the day. Um, ultimately, when it's alternate side parking, where you 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 will see people leave their vehicles there until. It's time for the, the, the street cleaning. These cars are, are, are moved quote, much more frequently than many cars around them on the block. Okay, I, I'm I'm just saying that 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 with the zip car or you know that company they were they are available, so I, I was able to use it and still am. But that's why I'm surprised this is needed in this area. Yeah, no, I think they're trying to get more people away from personal. There's no question they're trying to move more people away from personal cars. And this would give them an option that makes it possible for their few car trips they want to make. No, because no, I, 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 I am a member of Zipcar. So, you know, I just go to designated parking lots and I would just borrow their car for a few number of hours, you know, for, for a few hours and return it back to the lot. 
This must be cheaper. Betty, can I chime in? Uh, yes, you can. And then Lucian, uh, Lucian, did you speak your piece? Yeah, I'm lower. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just tend to agree with Eric that this is, I mean, I don't know that this is a great thing for lower Manhattan in, in the sense that it, while it's a lofty goal to get people to use fewer personal vehicles and I guess this is sort of a form of public transport in a way, but it seems like the DOT is competing with private companies and using our already clogged um, public spaces to do it. We have enough stuff going on in our parking lanes and travel lanes and things we're trying to figure out. We spent over 90 minutes earlier tonight trying to figure out how to just upload and unload cardboard boxes. I think it's a terrible idea that we would, that the DOT is now going to introduce yet another use of our street space. Just it's, it's enough already. Like we got enough else to figure out. That's my problem, idea. Yeah, no, and I do suggest we take a look at it over time to see how well accepted or utilized they are in our district. But Cody and Detta, and then we'll go out of committee. I, I just think it's sort of a bad use of public space yeah. um, to park, you know, to introduce more car sharing. If the goal is to, you know, cut down the number of car trips, I mean, it just seems it's going to exacerbate them. You know, that's just a thought. <laughs> yeah, well, but that's what I think what we have to look at is does it really exacerbate them or does it get more people to not own cars that they're just storing? <laughs> They have an option for something they can use when they when they need them, which is I think what they're hoping and mm -hmm. saw in the pilot. And, and I'm happy. And I know people with too. Right. Uh, so could, let's have Detta, and then we'll go through Mariama, Pat, and Justine. Yeah, to me, this is like the difference between one of those bike rental shops where you can rent a bike for a half day or a full day versus bike share where where you're just using it for a short ride for half an hour for an hour so that might be why there is this demand for both types of car share programs so i'm um, i Car share uh, in any form is I think something worth pursuing and uh, we'll see what works. Yeah, and I agree. I think we'll see is I think we need this is something we need to follow up on and get the data on, but gotta kind of run the pilot in our neighborhoods to find out. So mm -hmm. Mariana. I don't think we should push back on the pilot, but I think we should push back on the taking of um, what appeared to be by the pictures currently residential public parking spaces as opposed to some of these municipal parking spaces that are either often empty or often hold cars that never move like on my block there are cars all down gold street in the public meters where the city could be making some money that are municipal cars that are always there they're never not there so i think that the city needs should we should instead push back and ask the city find a location for for their cars that are taking up um, parking spaces and donate those to a program like this because i'm not opposed to the program but i would be opposed to um taking a, taking away another residential parking space when there's so few in lower manhattan and i park my car inside so it's not for me it, it it's but it's it's the it's, that's not the point you know it's but the these are residential of the parkers. Matter. yeah but these are residential parkers that's what I'm saying. It looks like from the pictures, I could tell that they were residential cars. So the, it's residents that are going to be losing public parking spaces. No, 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 than... no, no, no. The ride share are residents too. I understand that, but there are parking spaces that owned by the, that are taken up by the city. Some that are publicly metered that should be for the public. They don't that the public doesn't get to use. And then there are some that the city takes up and rarely uses. It's owned by this office, this office, this office, and you never see anybody even park there. They're just taking up the space. No one else is allowed to park there. And then they have 
the others where they are designated and they're taking those two. And so now the, the, with a few residential space, public spaces, or, or not only resident, any member of the public that's visiting or anything can use that space. We're going to take away those two when there's well, not being taken the away. City, the city should be relinquishing, relinquishing theirs. Um, and that, that's my, that's okay, we'll know that issue. And again, we already have done a resolution on that. And there was definitely agreement on we need fewer city vehicles. But nevertheless, keep in mind, Let's these stick it in here again, then. if we already support it, then that's more of a reason to stick it in here. Okay, multiple residents are using it versus one resident tying up the whole parking space. So keep in mind, and there's a picture that's going to come up soon to show you kind of why I think the DOT is probably doing it. Uh, more than Justine? Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't understand it because. I agree with Miriam, and that's what I was going to say. I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't own a car. But the people who live here and pay taxes here should be able to park on the street. And it seems to me, as Eric said, you if you belong to Zipcar or any other car rental place, you go to their lot and you rent the car. And then if you need to park it, you park, you fight for parking just like anybody else. I don't see why the city is allowed to take parking space that residents need and i know you keep saying it is for residents but it is, it is a residence for the businesses the businesses are using these two spots no, for cars no, no, no. they rent to residents let me see if i can reframe it for you i want to use zip car because i can't think of the other two companies at the moment i know people who who have used these i do not own a car i live here I get no space on the street because I do not own a car. Now you're telling me I can't have a car that I share with 12 of my neighbors in one space because that's too greedy because somebody who owns one car for only their family should get that space instead? That's yeah, but what I don't understand, well, Betty, is that if you're renting from Zipcar, you go to their lot and you pick up the car. Why and should I pay more for Zipcar and have to pay for paid parking when somebody else doesn't? Hey, that's why I said I'm not I'm not opposed to the program. It's it's the taking away of residential parking. That's but it's residential parking. I'm not understanding. Okay. It, it's Betty, can I just really quick cut in? Is this are we looking for a resolution on this topic? No. No. Okay. Then I'll just. People are just venting. Can I say something, Betty? Uh, Justine gets to speak first because I, she was called yes. on. Yes. Okay. Of course. Thanks, Mitch. No, I, I have to say, Betty, so the reason why I agree with Mariama, with Pat, what she was saying, is taking up a parking, two things I'm going to tell you. It's taking up a parking space because, okay, you're putting me, you're putting the person who's, who's going to share the car with 12 other families in the same boat as the person who owns a car but doesn't, can't afford to, doesn't want to have a parking space. Mm -hmm. You're taking away if there's 10 parking spaces now there's only nine for that one person here okay so step one it is taking up residential parking but it's also going to increase the congestion of the of the streets because a lot of the people who have and this is good or bad people who have cars that they park on the street they only move them when they really have to and really want to use them okay because it's too hard and difficult especially in battery park city to find a parking space so you move it when you need it, and then you have to come back and fight and find for a space. Um, if we have a zip car there, and we've got the two spaces, well, you know, two, four spaces in the north neighborhood, two spaces in the south neighborhood, we're going to be having these cars driving around all the time because, as you just said, the whole concept of zip car is use it for a few hours, put it back, the next person comes in and takes it and put it back. You've got these cars driving around. Those spaces. The people who own their cars don't use their cars like that. Can't if they're using their cars like that, like my my lovely friend Mariama, who 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 is 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 using her kid, her car to drive her kids around and stuff like that. And back when my mom was someone who I have to take her around for doctor's appointments and do stuff for, I needed a parking garage because I was moving my car multiple times a day, or even if it was once a day, because I would be spending hours looking for a parking space and maybe never find one. So that's step one. So those are the two things. Number one, it is taking up residential parking. So we would be losing six spaces on top of losing more spaces in the street if we're going to be using the street for loading and unloading. So Mariama's idea saying instead of taking a residential 
parking space that's a legal parking space, maybe they look at it and have we been living with, with um, darn placard parkers who take up the spaces, maybe giving this space a placard parking space. I don't even know. But basically saying, you want to give this to somebody, give it to municipal vehicles, and, or I'm sorry, take it away from the music, municipal vehicles that are abusing the space versus people who live here. And it's very different in different places. Uptown, it may be a very different picture. Here, it is ridiculously difficult to find a parking space. You, you could go for days without finding one. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from Lucian. I, I don't think any, I don't think any of this is mutually exclusive. The, Just, the mayor said he was going to. I think reduce the size of the municipal fleet. Do I, mm -hmm. am I recalling that correctly? Yes, I know that under Bloomberg, they had a program where. Um, they were using car share vehicles for agencies when they needed them. So, essentially, they were putting off the cost of maintaining a motor pool to the car share company, but splitting that cost with residents or whomever else uh, were using those, those car share vehicles. So, I think in a sense, I, I don't know if the city is, you know, out, I don't think they're outwardly saying this, but I think the, the, the fact that both of these things are coinciding is not uh, an accident, that they're they're trying to create more frictionless uh, uh, ways to access car share while also reducing the size of the municipal fleet. I think that you will see um, some of these other spaces open up as these agencies can find that these vehicles are available when they need them during the business hours. Um, that's pre precisely when um, you know they need vehicles and residents most likely need vehicles uh, after business hours. So it's a way to to reduce that. So that's 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 what um, I think is likely to happen. Yeah, thank you. And there are more things going on with curbs, such as loading zones and other things that are going to bring more change. But who knows? It's a journey. Uh, hello, hello, Betty. Yes, Mitch. Thank you. Uh, I just before I actually was going to make a comment uh, where I pretty much agree with Marianne, but I just want to ask Lucian. So if you could just confirm. So you said that a resident and the municipal fleet will could, could be sharing the same car sharing service, correct? Yeah, it's happened in the past. OK, the yeah, and I, that's uh, fine. A, a big zip, uh, and, zip and then, account. Then that makes Marianne's 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 point a win win and 100 percent spot on where if if they're going to be shared then somehow give them two placard spots whether you whether you give put a placard or something in 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 the dashboard or, or or somehow give them two placard spots this way it doesn't affect anybody else and it doesn't hurt anybody else in in in, in the neighborhood and you know it's it's to me it's that's a win win and and it keeps the program and less cars on the street if they're sharing but it's uh to me that that bolsters Mariama's point uh, you know, thank you. Yeah, well, thanks everybody. And let's move on. We'll keep an eye on it, see what happens, but they know where they are. Updates and news, so hopefully go very quickly on this. This will point out goals and principles. This is on the DOT's website to point out moving people efficiently. This is, there is a new street design manual that came out. And I understand and it's at this location online. It uh, is recent that it came out. You can go see things uh, at, I think it's a Pratt University until the middle of January to ask questions about it. Uh, but in fact, it was finalized before COVID. So in 2019, it was finalized and then it kind of got put on the shelf to wait. But to keep in mind, their biggest priority is for walking. In street design, the next let tier will be bikes, buses, and paratransit. The next tier down will be shared use vehicles. And the final and last priority will be personal vehicles. So keep in mind, a lot of the changes we're going to see are going to be consistent with this now that they've published it. Other announcements, City Bike officially hit 10 million bike e-bike rides for the year. So yay. Uh, the, Second, second Sunday, they had over 2 million rides uh, on the MTA, on the subways. So they are starting to bounce back a bit, but 
have a ways to go, especially in tolls. There is a 2023 MTA fare and toll increases that are coming. So in 2023, there's a $2.6 billion budget gap expected next year. Uh, the officials have asked for 5.5% more in fares and tolls, which is more than the typical 4%, but I understand there was a year where there was nothing because of COVID. So it's not that out of line, especially given the inflation that we're experiencing. Uh, if 5.5% is across the board, this would move uh, subway and bus fares from 275 to 290. But fares may not be lifted the same way on everything. For instance, bridge customers and tunnel customers may get bigger increases and they may leave decide to leave subways and buses just with smaller increases. We don't know and won't know until the approved budget comes out in 2023, and then you'll get the exact fares. And there will be public hearings at that time, but of course they're not announced yet. There also was a rule that has come out, but I can't find it posted yet, so I don't know the outcome. New York City Police Department has asked SAPO, Street Activity Permit Organization, to deny permits again in the calendar year 2023. So we'll have, I looked to see what the action was because it was on November 28th. It's no longer pending, so it's not available online, but they don't have the results up of what happened at the meeting on November 28th. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that for 2023. Transportation Infrastructure Committee at City Council, a couple of them passed and the one with the, pride, the public bathrooms, yay, uh, actually made a step forward. This may involve us because it will ask the DOT as well as the parks departments to report feasible locations for public bathrooms across the city. So we may be hearing some of that and they have a year to come up with their suggestions. So they have all of 2023. There's a taxi, ma taxi meter fare rate and surcharges all going up uh, on December 19th. So you're gonna be seeing this very soon. The initial fare charge is going to go from $250 to $3. Taxi cab improvement surcharge is going to go from $0.30 cents to $1 and on and on. The additional unit charge is increasing from $0.50 cents to $0.70. Cents. There's a rush hour surcharge that's going up from $1 to $2.50. There's a nighttime surcharge going up from $0.50 cents to $1. The flat rate is going into effect for uh, going to JFK but, and there's also one to LaGuardia, but they're also instituting a new surcharge if you're going to an airport. So, expect more money coming up on December 12th when you get into a taxi cab and you may wanna check some of the rates so you're not shocked. Also, DCAS put through a rule change and there are gonna be side guard rails on large vehicles. So sorry, Pat, it's not going to be on commercial haulers. It's going to be on city owned vehicles. But nevertheless, because of in individuals and cars and bike riders being sucked underneath and injured by these various vehicles, that's the purpose of these side guard rails. And that's going to affect on the 1st of next year. And I believe this is the last thing that I had. So, yes, uh, Lucian, did you have final comment? Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. I'm good. Thank you, Betty. Great, and like I said, I hopefully will get the draft document, the draft uh, resolution out to you in advance of others, so you can may please make comments to me and Lucian uh, about your concerns. Don't leave it all for full board because we don't want to take up an hour like we did last month. Thanks a lot. Have a great month. Thank so you. I'll see you at the next meeting. Thanks, Betty.